In any event, we came from Israel in 1988 to meet to study theology in Britain. I'd been to secular university as a kid. I studied science, but I never studied theology formally until my old age. But one of the things we tried to do where I worked in the Pentecostal ministry to the Jews is we tried to help Christians to understand the Jewish background of their faith and of the New Testament. Our main purpose is witnessing to Jewish people, but we also try to equip born-again believers in our Pentecostal churches to understand the Jewish background of their own faith. You know, a Jew reading the New Testament in the time of Jesus, a Jew in the first century, he would have opened John's Gospel, and the Gospel of St. John would have looked very different to him than it does to you. To begin with, he would have called it Bessorah Baal Te Yohanan, the good news according to John. And he would have said it's something called a midrash, a midrash on Breshit, a midrash on the book of Genesis. He would have said John chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 talks about the new creation. It's the new creation narrative. And it's a midrash on the creation in Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. The Gospel of John, the new creation, helps us as, as a way to interpret the creation in Genesis. That's what he would have said in his way of thinking. He would have said, well... God walks the earth in the creation, in Genesis, and now God walks the earth in the new creation, in John. God comes to separate the light from dark in the creation, in Genesis, and God comes to separate the light from dark in the new creation, in John. And the Spirit moves on the water and brings forth the creation, in Genesis, and then the Spirit moves on the water and brings forth the new creation, in John chapter 3. And then you have the small light and the great light in the creation, in Genesis, and then you have someone he would have called Yohanan Hamadbil, John the Baptizer, or John the Baptist, the small light, and Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the great light in the creation. Now metaphorically, in Midrash, in rabbinic metaphor, the tree of life is represented by a fig tree, the tree of life that's in the garden, that seems to be in Ezekiel 47, and that appears again in the book of Revelation. The tree of life is represented by a fig tree. So, midrashically, when Jesus sees Nathanael under the fig tree in John's Gospel, Jesus wasn't simply saying to Nathanael, I saw you under a literal fig tree. He was saying something much deeper. He was saying, I saw you from the garden, from the creation, from the foundation of the world. I foreknew you. It's a whole other way of reading the scripture that the church has lost sight of. The first Christians were Jews. Every writer of the New Testament was a Jew, except for Luke, who was a convert to Judaism. And to properly understand it and interpret it, we have to go back and begin understanding it in that context, the context God gave it. It's called the Tzitzimliban, if you like theology. But when we came to this country, our daughter, Batmiel, was already a believer. We have two children. Our son's name is Ali Ami, which means, my God, my people. And our daughter's name is Batmiel, both born in Israel, Galilee. Batmiel means daughter from God. So when we came, Batmiel was already a believer. My wife found her praying in our flat in Jerusalem, at our Haifa, asking Jesus to forgive her sins, Yeshua, and to come into her heart and to be her Messiah. But when we came to this country, our daughter Batmiel had a lot of questions that I found it very difficult to answer. Her first question was, how come the Gentile believers call our Messiah Jesus? She knew him by his real name, Yeshua. How come in England people go to church on Sunday instead of to the Messianic Fellowship, the Asifa Mishachit on Shabbat on Saturday? What's Christmas? She knew about Hanukkah. Jesus celebrated Hanukkah in John 10, but she didn't know anything about Christmas. Hagamalad. How come children get dressed up for Halloween in England? On Bible college, they told us it was of absolutely demonic origins anyway. But, uh, in Israel, the children get dressed up for Purim, the Feast of Esther, in February. She couldn't understand this. She never had any idea of Christianity as the Gentile world and the Gentile church sees it. All she knew was that she was a little Jewish girl from Galilee, and Jesus was from Galilee, and he was the Jewish Messiah. That's all she knew. She had no idea about the Western church or the Gentile church or Gentile Christianity. No idea. Jesus was her Messiah. She was from Galilee, he was from Galilee, she's Jewish, he was Jewish, that's it. He's the one the prophets predicted. That's all she knew. 
But when you read the book of Acts, you see that's the only thing that the early Christians knew. The only thing. But the church has lost sight of its roots. In Romans 11, St. Paul says, don't let that happen. The Gentiles are the branches of the tree, but underneath the surface are the roots of the tree. And if the roots die, the tree dies. If the roots weren't there, we wouldn't be here either, Paul tells us. Don't lose sight of the roots. But the church has done that. Anyway, with these things in view, open with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 21. Commencing in verse 33. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it. And he built a tower. And he rented it out to vine growers. And he went on a journey. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. And the vine growers took his slaves and beat one and killed another and stoned the third. And again he sent another group of slaves, larger than the first, and they did the same thing to them. And afterwards he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? And they said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vine growers to other vine, the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper seasons. Over and over, Jesus was trying to warn the Jews that the Gentiles would believe when they wouldn't. He said, no sign will be given to this generation except the sign of the prophet Jonah. The Ninevites, the Gentiles, repented and believed when the Jews wouldn't. He said, Malki Sheva, the queen of Sheba, came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, a Gentile. Yet something greater than Solomon is here. He said, many will come from the east and the west and recline with Abraham and the patriarchs, but you, Israel, will be put to outermost darkness where men will weep and gnash their teeth. Over and over, Jesus was trying to warn the Jews that a time would come when they would reject their own Messiah and God would turn his grace to the Gentiles. Now, if you could read Greek, you could read the Old Testament in Greek, that's called the Septuagint, and you'd see the only thing that Jesus was doing in Matthew 21 and the parable of the vineyard was that he was paraphrasing the same parable from Isaiah chapter 5. The parable of the vineyard first happens in Isaiah 5, and over and over, Isaiah says the same thing. Seven places, Isaiah says, the Messiah would cause the Gentile nations to believe in the Jewish God, but the Jews would reject him. Seven places, at least clearly seven places, and it alludes to it many other places throughout the book of Isaiah. This is a continual theme throughout Isaiah. But in chapter 65, the next to the last, the penultimate chapter, things come to a real head. Jesus is just trying to tell the Jews what Isaiah did. Look at Isaiah 65. I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. In other words, God would allow himself to be found by non-Jews. Before this, only Jews basically had the truth. I said, here am I, here am I, in Hebrew it's much stronger, hineni, hineni, to a nation which did not call on my name. Now that word nation in Hebrew is the word goy. It's the same word for Gentile. The Hebrew word for nation and Gentile is the same word. The only thing Gentile means is a nation. I permitted myself to be found by the Gentiles who didn't know who I was. And in verse 2 he says why? Because I've spread my hands out all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way that's not good. After centuries of pleading with them, God turns his grace to the Gentiles, Isaiah predicts. And in verse 13, he tells the whole history of what happened to the Jewish people and their tragic suffering through the centuries. <laughs> Pogroms, inquisitions, holocausts, all of it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, but you, the Jews, shall hunger. Behold, my servant shall drink, but you, the Jews, shall thirst. Behold, my servant shall rejoice, but you shall be put to disgrace. Behold, my servant shall shout joyfully with a glad heart, but you will cry out with a heavy heart and will wail with a broken spirit. 
and you will leave your name for a curse to my chosen ones, and the Lord God will slay you. But look at this. But my servants will be called by another name. Christians. You see how that happened? That exactly happened. You see, what Jesus was saying, and what Isaiah was saying, is this. Jesus wept over Jerusalem in Matthew 23. And he was saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, why wouldn't you listen to me? For centuries I pleaded with you. I sent you my messengers. You're my covenant people. You were in a covenant relationship with me. I gave you my promise, my truth, my provision, and you broke the covenant. I sent you my messengers. I sent you Jeremiah, but you put him in prison. I sent you Isaiah, but you killed him. I sent you Zechariah, but you killed him. I sent you John the Baptist, but you killed him. I sent you preachers of righteousness who brought revival. I sent you Ezra and Nehemiah and Josiah, but you forgot those revivals. You've rejected my son, now I'm going to the Gentiles. But is that all there is to it? Is God finished with the Jews, and that's all there is to it? The New Testament gives us the clearest answer in two places. Look at the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 21, verse 24. In Luke 21, 24, Jesus says directly that Jerusalem will be trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is completed. And there are two very important Greek words, plethéron, until, and ethnon. A time would come not only when the Jews would be back in their land, but back in their capital. And it would mean the Gentiles' time was coming to a close. Now the ultimate fulfillment and meaning of the Olivet Discourse in Luke 21 and Matthew 24, it's bound up with the prophecies of the prophet Daniel, ultimately. But Jesus deals with the national aspect of the Jews being restored. They lost their kingdom and their empire sometime earlier during the Babylonian captivity, but Jesus spoke of a time when they would get it back. In Romans 11, 25, St. Paul uses the same two words and speaks of the time of the Gentiles. In Romans 11, 25, this is what St. Paul says. I do not want you to be uninformed of this mystery, my brethren, lest you be wise in your own estimation. So he's telling us a mystery, and he wants us to be informed of it. That a partial hardening has happened to Israel, a partial hardening, and he uses the same two words, Tetheron and Ethnon, until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. A time would come, St. Paul says, when Jews would again begin returning to Jesus. Romans 11 makes it clear that the first Christians were Jews and the last Christians are going to be Jews. Jesus deals with the national aspect, but St. Paul deals with the salvific or the soteriological aspect. He deals with their salvation. Jesus talks about them getting their land back, but Paul talks about them returning to Christ. You see, many times in history, many times, Bible-believing Christians thought it was the last days. Many times, at least a dozen major times, people just like yourself and myself were convinced Jesus was going to come in their lifetime. What makes this time in history different from the other times in history? If they were always wrong, why should we be right that Jesus can come in our lifetime? What was missing then that's not missing now? Let's begin in the first century. In the first century, there was someone named Simeon. He was Jesus' cousin. And after the apostle James was martyred, he became the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. And when Jerusalem was surrounded by an army of Gentiles, as Jesus predicted, Simeon remembered what Jesus said. When you see Jerusalem surrounded, flee to the mountains. And he fled to a place called Pila, and the believers were rescued. And you can read in the history of Josephus what happened to Jerusalem after the believers were rescued. It's a type of the Great Tribulation. The prophet Daniel predicted the Messiah would come and die before the second temple was destroyed. Jesus came and died, and the temple was going to be destroyed, and the believers knew it, and they escaped. But when they escaped, 
They remembered what Jesus said. He spoke about this happening in the context of the end of the world in Matthew 24 and so on. They thought it was the end. The first person they ever counted 666 to be the number of his name with using the Greek and, and, and Latin numerals was the Emperor Nero. He began as a nice person. He looked very much like the Antichrist. But then he turned against the church and ultimately it led to the Roman Empire coming against the Jews. And the believers thought he was the Antichrist. In fact, what it says in Revelation about the, the, the kings, six was, one, is, one was and is not and is to come, they thought that meant Nero was going to be incarnated or his spirit would come back in some way. Then there was Babylon. The whole thing that you see in Isaiah and Revelation and, 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 and Jeremiah and then in Revelation about fallen, fallen is Babylon. The early Christians identified Babylon with Rome. That's why you see the end of Peter's epistle. The end of St. Peter's epistle, he writes, she who was in Babylon greets you. You see, the false religions that began in Babylon with Nimrod and all that in the book of Genesis found their way through Asia Minor, particularly the city of Pergamum, into the Greek and Roman world. And from there, they found their way into things like medieval Roman Catholicism and Freemasonry and so on. But these things all come from Babylon. So they thought that Rome was Babylon. The first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians on the day Tisha B'Av, on the Hebrew calendar, roughly the 9th of August. And the second temple was destroyed the same day, centuries later, by the Romans. Tisha B'Av, under the same historical circumstances. This is Babylon to them. It's sort of like Scotland Yard. There's a little alleyway that runs between Whitehall and, and, and the Thames in London called Scotland Yard, a space between two buildings, which was the original headquarters of the Metropolitan Police. Now, it's not there anymore. The police headquarters is about a half mile away on Victoria Street. Still, they call it Scotland Yard. The name of its first location became the name of the institution. It didn't matter where Scotland Yard was. It's still Scotland Yard, even though it's not located there. So Babylon is the same way. It doesn't matter where Babylon is geographically. It carries the name of original Babylon. That woman on seven hills, the city on seven hills in Revelation, that was understood as Rome by the early Christians. There's very good reason why the reformers and so on were telling, warning people that the Pope is Antichrist and, and so on. Very good reason. Be that as it may, when under Nero, Rome burns, the Christians said, that's it, fallen is Babylon. The temple's destroyed. Jesus is coming. And then you've got this meteorological phenomena when you have a very, very big volcano, like happened in 77 AD, around the same time, Mount Vesuvius exploded in Italy. The last time this happened in our times was in the late 60s in Iceland. When there's a very big volcano, enough volcanic ash goes into the, to the upper stratosphere, and into the ionosphere, and the sun and moon don't give their light. It obstructs the solar and lunar radiation from penetrating the Earth. So they see Jerusalem surrounded by an army of Gentiles, the sun and moon aren't giving their light, Nero, the emperors are demanding to be worshipped, the Antichrist, fallen as Babylon, what more do you want? Jesus is coming. It looked just like it to them. See what I'm saying? But Jesus didn't come. They were convinced he was going to, but he didn't show up. In the second century, there was someone called Simon Bar Kokhba. Now in John's Gospel, Jesus makes a double prophecy about the Antichrist. He says, if another comes in my name, him you will believe, predicting that the Jews will follow another Messiah. And ultimately, that will be the Antichrist. He'll convince the Jews he's their Messiah in some way. But in the short term, it applied to someone called Simon Bar Kokhba. He was proclaimed to be the Messiah by a famous rabbi called Rabbi Akiva. Now, the Jewish believers, the Jewish Christians said, no, no, Simon Bar Kokhba is not the Messiah. Jesus was. So Rabbi Akiva excommunicated the Jewish Christians from the synagogue and they've been excommunicated ever since simply because they wouldn't follow this false messiah. And to this day, this false messiah, Bar Kokhba, is still an honored hero of the Jewish people despite the fact that he was a false messiah who got them driven out of their land in the second century. And a terrible battle happened in Betar near Jerusalem with people hiding under the rocks and these prophecies in Revelation and Zechariah and so on happened. Let the rocks fall on us and hide us. They thought it was the end, that Jesus was coming. But he didn't come. In the 18th century, believers in England were convinced Napoleon was the Antichrist. They were sure. They really believed it. You've got to understand about Napoleon and why they thought this. The same as today, 
that the, the economy of the West depends so much on Western oil. If, if Kuwait gets invaded, the Americans and British go to war over it. In the ancient world, the economy of the West depended on spices from the Middle East. And when the Pope wanted to control the spice trades to the East, that's why he sent the Crusades. Because it was an agricultural economy, the way that food would be preserved and make it taste better. Now, finally, the Crusades were defeated by someone called al Salahadin at the Horns of Hattin in Galilee. And the balance of power in the Middle East goes into the hands of the Muslim world. But now, centuries later, Napoleon goes to reverse this and take the balance of power in the Middle East back for the West. And it begins to look like the prophecies of Daniel to the Christians at the time. He has a military defeat at the city of Acre, the biblical port of Ptolemy in, in Galilee. And it begins to look like what Daniel said, the kings of the south will rise up against him. Then he defeats the Muslims, the Mamelukes, at Cairo near the pyramids. Then he defeats them again in northern Galilee, in the hills of Galilee, near a place called Itzfat. But then he says, I'm going to set up my personal empire in Palestine and bring the Jews back. That's what he said. And again, Daniel said he'll enter the beautiful land and the Jews will come back. He goes up to Mount Tabor. He overlooks the valley of Armageddon, where the story of Deborah takes place. And he says, this is the perfect place for my ultimate military campaign. And he comes down in the valley of Armageddon with the French legions, totally defeats the Muslim world, and the balance of power in the Middle East is thrown back into the hands of the West. Then he comes back to Europe and he tries to reunite the Roman Empire by force. He takes the emperor's crown and puts it on his own head and proclaims himself the emperor of this resurrected version of the Roman Empire. He's going to bring the Jews back to Palestine? And this is the beautiful land, the battle of Armageddon, the resurrected Roman Empire? This is the Antichrist. Look just like it to them. I told you this morning that when you read the New Testament or you read biblical prophecy or eschatology from a Jewish perspective, it's impossible not to be premillennial. All this stuff that you see amillennialism and postmillennialism that the Restoration Movement is into and, and the Church of England is into, those things were invented by early Roman Catholicism. The earliest Christians, the people closest to the apostles, we can prove from history, were all premillennial. Be that as it may, they had a problem when Constantine ostensibly converted to Christianity for political reasons. They didn't know what to do about the millennia. So someone named Augustine comes along and begins saying it's fulfilled in the church. The millennia is the reign of the church. So in the year 999 AD, people began giving their money and their land and their castles to the Pope because they said, that's it, the millennia is almost over, the thousand year reign is almost over, and Jesus will be back in 1000 AD. Nobody got their money back. The Plymouth Brethren were convinced in the 1930s that Mussolini was the Antichrist. The Aliyah was on the way. The, the Jews are going back to Israel. He makes a covenant with the Pope, the Lateran Council. They were convinced. He said he's going to resurrect the Roman Empire. They were convinced. There were people in the Reformation called Anabaptists. Now, if you're a Pentecostal, don't consider yourself to be a Protestant. The Protestants killed people like you. You believe in the gifts of the Spirit and believers' baptism. Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, they wrote against you and their followers murdered you. Zwingli said, you want to be baptized again, huh? You don't think being baptized as a baby is good enough? He cut a hole in the ice in Zurich and he put the Anabaptists under and drowned them. The Anabaptists were much closer to the Bible than Luther or Calvin or Zwingli, much closer. They believed in the gifts of the Spirit. They believed in believers' baptism. They didn't hold to tradition. They didn't believe in a state church. They were not Erastians. They were much closer. Pentecostals are the just, we believe basically the same things as the Anabaptists believed then. Don't think of yourself as a Protestant. The Protestants killed people like us. But you see, long before Luther, Calvin, and Zwingli came along, there were always true believers. Always. There were always true believers. It's just that the political changes in Europe happened that Luther and Calvin and Zwingli were able to get away with things that other people were killed for saying before that. In England, there was a, someone called Wycliffe and his followers, the Lollards, trying to get back to the Bible. In Europe, there were many groups like the Waldensians and the Bohemian Brethren and followers of Jonas Hus. But you had something called the Holy Roman Empire, which was neither holy nor Roman. 
and the Pope could always stop the spread of the gospel. But then by the 16th century, feudalism declined and capitalism began to emerge. And with that, the nation state was born. People began saying, I'm Scottish, I'm English, I'm German. And the central power of the Pope was broken. He couldn't stop, didn't have the political leverage to stop the spread of the gospel anymore. He tried it with the Jesuits, but he still couldn't stop it. Be that as it may, the printing press was invented. And no, people no longer needed the Vulgate, the Latin Bible copied by hands. Now you had Bibles in English and German and so on. And Bibles were being mass produced. And the gospel took off. So the Anabaptists, some of them, became hyper-charismatic. They became what we call today Kingdom Now people. That we're going to conquer the whole world for Jesus, set up his kingdom and cause him to come back. The same as what like, people like Bryn Jones and Roger Foster, this kind of beliefs that you see today, the people who believed that then were called the Anabaptists. In the early church, there were people who believed the same thing called Montanists. But then in the 16th century, they were called the Anabaptists. And then today we call them the, the, the Kingdom Now movement, the Restoration movement. But they all have the same beliefs. So these people began saying, we're the kingdom now, we're the kingdom now. You know, we're going to conquer the whole world for Jesus and set up his kingdom. Then he's going to come back, instead of what, what the Bible says about the falling away and the persecution and all this. So some of them began following people called the prophets of Zwickau, who began making wild predictions that failed to happen. You remember how, like, these guys from Kansas City came to the Docklands Arena in London in August of 1990? And in front of 11,000 people a night, night after night, on video, on film, in books, they began saying this big revival is going to happen in England in October of 1990. The Holy Spirit's going to fall. All Britain would be one for Christ overnight, and then all Europe. They predicted this in August of 1990, but they actually had written it before then. But they predicted it in front of tens of thousands of people. You can get the videos. Well, of course... October came and went, November came and went, 1991 came and went, 1992 came and went, almost to 1990, just the biggest revival since Wesley and we missed it. <laughs> <laughs> the same with what the, what the Kansas City prophets say today, they were called the prophets of Zwickau then, saying the same kinds of crazy things and, and making predictions that failed to happen, which Deuteronomy 18 says makes them a false prophet and never check it. Nonetheless, they were convinced Jesus was going to come. The Pope couldn't stop the spread of the gospel anymore. Fallen is Babylon. But Jesus didn't come. This has happened many times, at least a dozen times, believers thought it was the last days. Now, in all fairness to these people, they were not completely wrong. You see, from a Jewish understanding of the Bible, prophecy is not prediction, it's pattern. Let me explain what I mean. Remember when Jesus was born and he has to escape to Egypt to escape King Herod. And an angel comes when King Herod dies and tells Jesus' parents this. Come back now to, to Israel, it's okay. King Herod is dead. And he quotes from Hosea chapter 11 verse 1, Out of Egypt I've called my son. Now to our Western hermeneutics, our Western way of interpreting the Bible, we'd have to say that Matthew quoted Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, out of all context. When you say, out of Egypt I've called my son, you obviously, obviously, are talking about the Exodus, the children of Israel coming out. But Matthew says, no, it's about Jesus coming out. As I explained last night, Jewish prophecy is pattern. It's not simple prediction. Abraham comes out of Egypt in Genesis, and God judges Pharaoh. The children of Israel come out of Egypt, and God judges Pharaoh in the Exodus. Then the Messiah comes out of Egypt, right? And then 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we come out of Egypt and our salvation. Egypt being the world, Pharaoh being Satan, and, and, and Moses going to a mountain, making a covenant with blood. And then he leads the children of Israel through the Dead Sea into the Promised Land. It's like Jesus going to the Mount Calvary, making a covenant with blood, and leading us through baptism into the Promised Land. The same pattern. The ultimate fulfillment is again the book of Revelation. The way that Pharaoh's magicians were able to counterfeit the miracles of Moses and Aaron, that's what the Antichrist and false prophet are going to do, counterfeiting the miracles of Jesus and his anointed and his servants and so on. The same judgments that happened on Egypt happen again in the book of Revelation and so on. So that's the final meaning. You see what I'm saying? Jewish prophecy is not a prediction, it's a pattern. So in some way you can say, yes, Napoleon does teach something about the Antichrist. 
All these dem demagogue type world leaders who demand to be worshipped, like Ceausescu in Romania, and Kim Il sung in Korea, and uh, Idi Amin in, in Uganda, and Pol Pot in, uh, in, in Cambodia, Kampuchea, all these people, who Joseph Stalin, all of them are of that spirit. John says there are many antichrists in the world, but still Jesus didn't come. There are many fulfillments. Another example is something that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. He says, the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. Now in Aramaic, what that means is frightening. It's called the Shekutsa Meshomem. And if most Christians realized what that really meant, they'd be frightened to death. In any event, the point is, Jesus celebrated the Feast of Hanukkah in John chapter 10, in which they celebrate the fact that the temple was rededicated after the abomination of desolations had already been set up. There was something called the Maccabees, the Hanukkah story, when the temple was defiled, and this person called Antiochus Epiphanes, who is a major type of the Antichrist, sets up, slaughters a pig in the temple and sets up an image of himself and a statue of Zeus in the temple. So the abomination of desolations already happened. But Jesus says, no, it's going to happen again. In other words, what happened the first time is a type of what ultimately is going to happen. So again, in the Jewish way of thinking, there are many abominations of desolations. In 70 AD, when the Romans destroyed the Temple Mount, and they put pagan ensigns where the Holy of Holies had been and worshipped them, you can read this in Josephus, Again, symbolizing political dominion over the house of God, that was an abomination of desolations. When the emperor, emperor Hadrian, who built the wall across the north of uh, England to stop our Scottish cousins from burning down Wigan, <laughs> he built a city called Erolinus Capitolina, and he built a, a temple to Jupiter on the Temple Mount. And that was another abomination of desolations. Constantine's nephew, called Julian the Apostate, he tried to rebuild a temple, and all kinds of mysterious fires and things happened around it, as was recorded in history. It's another abomination. Even today, the Mosque of the Rock and the Dome of, Dome of the Rock and the Mosque of Aqsa that you see in the Temple Mount, they are abominations of desolations. All these things prefigure or typify the ultimate meaning. Once again, the Jewish way of thinking about prophecy is not prediction, it's pattern. So you've got to understand each cycle of the pattern to understand the ultimate meaning. You know what I'm saying? Hence, they were not completely wrong. Okay, so Bar Kokhba was not the ultimate antichrist, but he was an antichrist. And Napoleon was not the antichrist, but he was an antichrist. And the popes are not the antichrist, but they are antichrists. And Mussolini was not the antichrist, but he is an antichrist. But Jesus still didn't come. Once again, why should we be so convinced that Jesus can come in our lifetime. What makes this time in history different from the other times in history when Christians thought it was the last days? Is it because the countries that were important in the Bible are at the center of world events again? Is that what makes this time different? Well, I have no doubt in my mind the fact that the countries that were important in the Bible are at the center of world events again is of prophetic significance. I don't doubt that for one second. Yet, those countries were at the center of world events during the Crusades. Jesus didn't come. Those countries were at the center of world events in the days of Napoleon. But Jesus didn't come. If you're old enough to remember the Blitz, you remember what was happening. When Coventry was destroyed and Portsmouth and London and Liverpool and Manchester were all being bombed by the Luftwaffe, by the Germans, people couldn't understand why, why Montgomery and Churchill were sending British troops thousands of miles away to defend the Middle East at Al-Alaman. They couldn't understand this. When Britain itself was being attacked, why are you sending British troops thousands of miles away to defend the Middle East? The answer is, uh, on a, uh, I think they sold it, a map on the wall, a crusader map, a banner, it's on a banner, embroidered on a banner in the cathedral in Chester, which says that anyone who wants to control the world has to control the Middle East. And to control the Middle East, you have to control Palestine. Napoleon knew that. Pompey, the Roman, knew that. Alexander the Great knew that. The Crusades knew that. And Hitler knew that. So Rommel and Montgomery knew very well that if Rommel had wanted al Alaman, he would have crossed the Suez. He would have cut off the oil supplies from the Arabian Peninsula. He would have outflanked Russia on the south. He would have attacked India from the west as the Japanese were attacking from the east the British Commonwealth and the Empire would have been cut in half, and that would have been it. 
And so the British were sending thousands and thousands and thousands of troops to Al Alaman to defend the Middle East, even though Britain was being attacked. Those countries have always been important, have always been strategically important in world affairs. That in itself doesn't prove that we're in the last days. Maybe it's because of credit cards and so on, and numbering people's heads and all this kind of thing. Well, you know, believe me, I, I agree. These things are demonic. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, I mean, people have tried to number people's heads before. There was the Doomsday Book, right? To get economic control of the world. It's happened before. What makes this time different from the other times in history? What makes this time different? What was missing then that's not missing now? Well, I'll tell you two things. The first thing that's missing then, that's not missing now, is my daughter. Abba, why did the Gentile believers call our Messiah Jesus instead of Yeshua? That was missing a hundred years ago, it was missing five hundred years ago, it was missing a thousand years ago, but it's not missing anymore. According to the American College of Rabbis, more Jews have come to Christ in the last 18 years than in the last 18 centuries. There are probably 100,000 Jewish born-again Christians in North America. 85 to 90 percent of them have been saved in the last 15 to 20 years. It began in the Jesus movement, the hippie movement that I was saved out of. All these things like Christ for the Nations and Youth with a Mission, they all came from this revival among the hippies. We didn't find love and peace in taking drugs and in practicing what we call the free love. All we found were drug deals and people ripping each other off and venereal disease and the rest of it. But through that disillusionment with society and with the counterculture that was supposed to be an alternative to it, the Holy Spirit worked mightily. And hundreds of thousands of hippies got saved, including 30,000 Jewish hippies in California in one summer summer of 1967, when Jerusalem, by the way, was no longer trampled down by the feet of the Gentiles. In Ethiopia, we were astounded at how many of these black Jews from Ethiopia believe in Jesus. Astounded. They don't want people to know because they still have family back in Ethiopia who are trying to get to Israel. So many of them. I can't tell you how many of these Russian and Ukrainian Jews coming from the old USSR, coming to Israel, are believers. I was just in Israel recently, and Lord willing, I'll be back in a few weeks. It's incredible. Not only that, but they, many of them were saved in the underground Pentecostal and Baptist churches before Gorbachev, before Perestroika. So they're used to being persecuted. You see, in Israel, there's a lot of persecution against the Jewish believers. Our Pentecostal church in Jerusalem has been firebombed five times. The Baptist house in Jerusalem burned down. The Messianic congregation in Tiberias burned down. Ashdod burned down twice. These people are going to be perfect. Once you've been up against the KGB, who's afraid of the Lubavitch rabbi? Our Pentecostal church in Jerusalem has been firebombed five times. The Baptist house in Jerusalem burned down. The Messianic congregation in Tiberias burned down. Ashdod burned down twice. These people are going to be perfect. Once you've been up against the KGB, who's afraid of the Lubavitcher rabbi? <laughs> We're astounded. Tens of thousands of Jews are turning to Christ. This is just in California, Jack Hayford's church. There are 500 Jewish Christians in that church and its satellites. It's one church with 500 Jewish believers in that church and its satellites, its branches. Unbelievable. On the other hand, it's not just that the Jews are returning to Christ, they've returned to their land. I will say to the North, give them up. It's happening right in front of our eyes. Right in front of our eyes. Uh, it, it's absolutely an amazing thing to see if you've been to Israel. You see, God said he'd make Israel a barometer for the nations, a plumb line. You'll find that the people who are wrong about Israel are the ones who are wrong about other things. Who were the ones caught up in the kingdom now things? The same ones who are replacementist about Israel. Who were the ones who were the most ecumenical? The ones who were wrong about Israel. I'm not saying if people are right about Israel, it makes them right about other things. But inevitably, the ones who are wrong about Israel tend to be into other kinds of doctrinal error. 
But there's more to it than that. You see, if you go anywhere in the evangelical world where the church is still growing, North America, Northern Ireland, the poor countries particularly, Africa, South America, Asia, you'll find very few born-again Christians who would deny that God has an end times purpose for Israel and the Jews and that these events in the Middle East fulfill prophecy. It's only here in post-Christian, post-Christian Britain and Europe where it's a minority view. In Germany, 2% of the people go to church. In England, 8% of the people go to church once a month. And if Roman Catholics didn't believe it was a mortal sin to miss mass, it would be 4%. <laughs> Compared to Northern Ireland, where it's 80%, despite its problems, or the United States, where it's 50%. We don't live in a Christian country anymore. But when England still was a Christian country, you can read even Cromwell. You can read William Wilberforce, the Earl of Shaftesbury, Samuel Rutherford in Scotland, the main British theologians. They all believed the Jews had to return to Israel and God had a purpose for them at the end of the world in turning to Christ. The fact that it's not believed in this country anymore by many Christians is in itself symptomatic of the demise of the gospel in this country. You see, for over 200 years, this country was the epicenter of the evangelical world. It was your country, not America, that sent the most missionaries. It was your country that sent Dr. Livingston to Africa. It was your country that sent William Carey to India. It was your country that sent Hudson Taylor to China. It was your country that sent George Whitfield to the United States. And now it's your country that has to import Billy Graham. See what I'm saying? Something's gone wrong. And when this country still was Christian, it was popularly believed God had a purpose for Israel and the Jews. You go anywhere today where the church is growing, it's still believed. It's only here that's not Christian anymore where it's not believed. The point is this. I'm not saying that the time of the Gentiles is over. It wasn't one day it's the time of the Jews and then the next day it's the time of the Gentiles. Not Monday God's still dealing with the Jews and then Tuesday with the Gentiles. There was a period of transition that took place over several decades. Certainly the ministry of Paul and Barnabas to the Gentiles was a turning point in going from the time of the Jews to the time of the Gentiles. Certainly the destruction of the temple when biblical Judaism could no longer be practiced. That was another turning point. Bar Kokhba's rebellion when the Jews were kicked out of the synagogue was another turning point. And something called Habikat Menim and the Shemana a curse put on Jewish believers in the synagogue liturgy was another turning point. It wasn't one day it was for the Jews and the next day for the Gentiles. Similarly, I'm not saying one day it's still for the Gentiles and the next day it's for the Jews. I'm saying it's a period of transition. The Jews returning to Israel is a turning point. Jerusalem, being in the hands of the Jews, is a prophetic turning point. These things are turning points. We're going back the other way. You see, in the beginning of the church, Paul tells the Jews, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now the boots are on the other feet. The name of Jesus is blasphemed among the Jews because of the Gentiles. Do you know what Christianity means to my wife's parents? It means Jewish children being kicked into ovens. It means the Spanish Inquisition. It means the Holocaust. It means the Crusades. Read Romans 9 to 11. What is God's standard for the church? God's standard for the church, when will it be ready for Jesus to come back? What's the acid test? Because when it can provoke the Jews to jealousy. As we've mentioned last night in Romans of uh, Genesis 12, God promised Abraham that through your seed all the tribes of the earth will be blessed. Because through Abraham's descendants would come the Bible and the Gospel and the Messiah. The two kinds of people who are physically descended from Abraham, anthropologically, are Jews and Arabs. I have a video on it, on Jewish Arab, Jews and Arabs in prophecy. These are the two kinds of people descended from Abraham, through whom all the peoples of the earth were to be blessed. Who are the two kinds of people most difficult to see get saved? Jews and Arabs. Abraham's physical descendants. There's a spiritual and a theological reason for that. The reasons why Jews and Arabs are so difficult to reach with the gospel, the reasons are not simply historical or cultural, 
or sociological, they're spiritual and theological. If you can reach Jews, you can reach anybody. And the devil knows that. Now I want to tell you something in concluding. Mission statistics are telling us three things. The first thing that mission statistics are telling us is that God is turning his grace from the rich countries to the poor ones. The same as the Jews found out very painfully that God loves Gentiles just as much as he loves them. White people are finding out that God loves black people and yellow people and, and, and olive skinned people just as much as he loves honkies. And who's getting saved? The black people, the tan skinned people, the yellow skinned people, the red skinned people. That's where revivals are happening throughout the poor countries. God is turning his grace from the rich countries to the poor ones. And even here in Europe, it's the Catholic countries that we're seeing the most growth, not the Protestant ones. Secondly, Jews are returning to Christ as never before since the early centuries of the church. And the third thing the statistics tell us is this. At any time and place in history, there was one particular church, one particular group that God used the most. We don't think much of them anymore. We make fun of the Plymouth Brethren, six little old ladies meeting in a tin hut. But believe me, in the days of Dr. Bernardo and Hudson Taylor, they were nothing to laugh at. We don't think much of the Methodists anymore. Methodism is dead in the water. But in the days of John Wesley and Charles Wesley and George Whitfield, believe me, the Methodists were nothing to laugh at. The Baptists have had their day. The Moravians have had their day. Now, I'm not saying anything to denigrate those other churches and denominations. May God bless and revive every one of them to their former glories for His glory. But the fact is, all the mission statistics tell us one thing. We are having our day. Whose churches are at the forefront of growth and what God is doing in the world? Despite our raving penty swinging on the chandeliers, we are having our day. The biggest Muslim country in the world is not an Arab country. It's an Asian country, Indonesia. Two to three million Muslims get saved every year in Indonesia. The Indonesian government admits to a 7% Christian population, but they know it's at least 23% and growing. Whose churches? Pentecostal. And, and other types of charismatic churches. 31 of the 50 fastest growing churches in the United States are Assemblies of God. And 49 of the 50 fastest growing churches in the United States are some kind of Pentecostal. You go to the Philippines, 20,000 people get saved every week out of Roman Catholicism in Santiago, Chile. The same thing is happening in Brasilia, in Rio de Janeiro, and Mexico City. Tremendous revivals throughout Latin America. What happened in Europe in the 16th century, in the Reformation, when Europe was the center of the Roman Catholic world, demographically, population-wise, is happening in South America now. That's where most Roman Catholics live. That's why the Pope keeps going back to South America, doing his tap dance, please don't leave. In Guatemala, 10% of the population left the Roman Catholic Church in 10 years' time and became Christians through Pentecostalism. We're having our time in history. It's not unique that we're having our time in history. The Baptists had their day, the Lutherans had their day, you know, the Plymouth Brethren had their day, the Methodists had their day, now we're having our day. It's our turn, so what? It's not unique that we're having our time. What is unique is that we are having our time in history at the same time in history when God is beginning to turn his grace back to the Jews. See what I'm saying? When will the church be ready for Jesus to come? When it can provoke the Jews, if you can reach the Jews, you can reach anybody. You see, the point is this. We're running out of time. A time came for Israel when they ran out of time. But now the boots are on the other feet. The time of the Gentiles are being complete. God said to Israel, this, Israel, you are my covenant people, you had my word, you had my promise. And you broke the covenant. I sent you my messengers. I sent you Jeremiah, Israel, but you put him in prison. I sent you John the Baptist, but you killed him. I sent you Isaiah, but you killed him. I sent you Zechariah, but you killed him. 
I sent you preachers of righteousness who brought repentance and revival. I sent you Hezekiah and Josiah and Ezra and Nehemiah, but you've forgotten those revivals. You've rejected my son. Now I'm going to the Gentiles. We've reached the point in history where the boots are on the other feet. Now that same God says, you England, you Christian world, you were my people. You were in a covenant relationship with me. You had my promise, but you've broken my covenant. I sent you John Wycliffe, England, but you put him in prison. I sent you John Bunyan, England, but you put him in prison. I sent you my messengers. I sent you Ridley and Latimer and Hooper, but you killed my servants, England. I sent you preachers of righteousness, England, who brought revival. I sent you Wesley. I sent you Spurgeon. I sent you Whitfield. But you've forgotten those revivals. You've rejected my son. Now I'm going back to my ancient people, Israel. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I tell you by the Spirit of Jesus, it is happening. We are running out of time. It's our time in history for our churches. The time will not come again if we can reach the Jews, we can reach anybody. That's what God says. I'm not saying the salvation of the Jews is more important than the salvation of any other people. But I am saying that God has made them his standard. If we can reach his ancient people, his own people after the flesh, we can reach anybody. Are we going to do it? Or is Jesus going to get somebody else?